Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good evening, good evening. <clears throat> good evening, LaShonda and Victor and LaShondo. God bless you all for joining me this evening. Looking forward to having a great time today with the Word of God. God is really good. He's been doing wonderful things in our lives. And as we learn how to submit to His leadership by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to control and allow the Holy Spirit to dominate our thought life as we learn how to listen to the voice of the Lord and obey his commands and walk in his truth and righteousness. It is very vital to our Christian growth that every day we purpose to think godly thoughts as we have been discussing our lessons the last several weeks concerning the battlefield of the mind it's very important to know that we have an enemy <clears throat> that's working against us to destroy us. And his whole purpose is to keep you from knowing who you are and the dominion and the power that you have against the kingdom of darkness as we walk in the life that Christ has given to us as he goes before us to lead us as a shepherd leads his flock into pasture greens and prosperity. So everything that concerns our life is in the word. And we must stay in the word and allow the word to stay inside of our hearts. That we meditate on the word. We speak the word of God to ourselves. We encourage ourselves. Because there are moments in our lives where we find ourselves discouraged. We find ourselves faint hearted. But it doesn't matter what the enemy brings against you. You are victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the devil is a liar. We have the victory. We're overcomers. We're able to stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ because he has won the victory through his own sacrifice on the cross. Amen. And again, I welcome you to the Tuesday night Bible class. And I pray that God speaks to your heart as he does to mine concerning his word to give us a revelation, give us insight, give us understanding <clears throat> into the mysteries of the gospel that will transform our thinking to be conducive to the will of God as we learn how to take dominion over our thought life. The more you get in the word, the word will transform your thinking to become more and more like the mind of Christ. So Lord, tonight we thank you for another opportunity to share your word. I pray that something, oh God, tonight will be conveyed to our heart by the Holy Spirit to help bring a change in our lives, our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our character. <clears throat> Everything about us will be transformed by the renewing of our mind by the word of God. And I pray, Lord God, that you forgive us for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, Father God. Come into our hearts tonight, wash us clean, purify our thoughts and our actions, that everything we do, even the thoughts we think, will line up with the word of God, that you will be glorified. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. My sinus is messing up tonight, so y'all excuse me if I keep clearing my throat. It's my sinuses and the allergy season and <clears throat> stuff that's going on in the air that's affecting a lot of people who, who are have allergic reaction to different things. And mine is that pollen. And I tell you, it's been working on me since yesterday and really since the weekend. But that's okay because I still got the victory. I'm still more than a conqueror to Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> And we're going to get through this lesson tonight, the battlefield of the mind. We're in chapter five in the book. If you've been following along in the book, 
So um, if you got your book, uh, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures from, <clears throat> from the Bible. And one of the scriptures is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And it says, keep thy heart, which is your soul of mine, with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. And it's very important that we're watchful. That word saying keep thy heart, that means you got to cherish. You got to cherish your mind as if it's a diamond found in the rough. And you got to cherish your mind to guard your heart. Whatever you allow to come into it, that's going to have an impact against your life, the plan and the vision that God has for you. And if you don't keep your heart and secure your heart, it says out of it are the issues of life. And one thing God revealed to me concerning this passage of scripture, those issues is the word of God flowing through you. And the word has the ability to produce life inside of you that every word that come out of your mouth will produce life. And we have to get in the word of God and allow the word of God to be planted in our hearts as seeds. And when those seeds have been planted, the seeds will begin to produce after his own kind. As it says in Genesis, when God had given man the authority in the Garden of Eden, he told him, he said, every tree of the, of the garden, he said, is, you can eat of it. But the tree of good and evil, tree of knowledge, you can't eat of that one. And the reason why God forbidden them to eat of that tree is because he did not want the sinful nature to come alive inside of man. But we all know that there was an old serpent that was in the garden who came and deceived the woman to eat of the tree of good and evil, which introduced to all mankind a sinful nature, which caused us to abandon our authority, abandon our position, and lead us down a pathway of darkness and destruction. But God wants you to know that tonight, when we study God's word, he's going to give you a revelation. And that revelation is going to unfold in your heart the word of God that will give you insight into the mysteries of the gospel that will help transform your thinking. Transform just like metamorphosis. When a caterpillar goes into a place of cocoon, he begins to die to himself in the cocoon, go through a transformation process and begin to change. And when he's changed, he becomes a butterfly. And as he becomes that butterfly in total transformation, he has to break out of that cocoon and fly away. We are in a spiritual cocoon many times when God has delivered us, we go back to our comfort zones, the place where we feel the security for ourselves and we don't allow the spirit of God to bring us out. Why? That's bondage. That's a place of spiritual imprisonment. And in that place is a place of darkness. And God wants you to know tonight that you don't have to stay in that position or in that, in that spiritual prison but you can be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Give me one second here. And it says, A good man out of his good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is what? Good. So you're dealing with the heart, your soul mind. And the evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which what? Evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. So what seed that you plant in your heart, which is your soul mind, whatever you put in there, 
It's going to begin to go through a process of production. Because it begins to sprout roots in your mindset. And the root begin to manifest to bring forth more fruit from that seed that's been planted in your mind. So if you sow corruption, you reap corruption. But if you sow righteousness, you reap righteousness. So it's up to you to determine what are you going to allow yourself to speak over yourself, others to speak over your life, or people to introduce you to that's going to lead you down a pathway away from truth and righteousness. So you have a choice to make up your mind that in your mind, I'm going to choose life and I'm going to live. Our devotion today, it says, where the grace of God abounds, there is freedom. Lord, today I'm grateful. Your love is plentiful. I just want to be full of you night and day. Lord Jesus, Lord, I know where your spirit is, there is liberty. This means I am free because your spirit lives inside of me. Holy Spirit, have your way in me right now. It is your will I am seeking after forever. Father, according to the New Testament of your word, now I am under, under your law of love. Lord, all of your words will be fulfilled. The heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. Father, you are the same God in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. You have not changed your mind about right and wrong. Therefore, Holy Spirit, you have, have your way in me. Please tell me what it is you, you want me to achieve. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Crying out for more of you, God. And the reason I read this devotion because it reminds me of our lesson tonight. When we give way to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit reminds you that we're under God's law of love. And because the law, law of, love, of love that the works in our, in our hearts, God's word will never pass away. His word will be productive in your life to continue to produce right against wrong. So we have the choice to determine in ourselves, am I going to follow God's truth and righteous, or am I going to be subjective to the, the things of the world, <clears throat> which is the enemy, and allow myself to be driven into a pathway of darkness. So you have to make that choice within yourself. So in our book in chapter 5, it said, it shall be done as you have believed. Matthew chapter 8, verse 13. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 13 it tells us that we have to believe. <clears throat> you have to believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus, he said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. As his servant was healed in the same self same hour. And this is when a centurion came to Jesus and said, Lord, I want you to uh, uh, just send the word. And I know my servant will be healed. He said, I'm not worthy of you. Come under my roof. I'm a man of authority, just like you're a man of authority. So if you just speak one word, my servant will be healed. That's great faith. Jesus said he had never found nobody with such great faith as this centurion. So it says, in the same hour as he was talking with Jesus, his servant was healed. Why? Because he believed it. What are you believing God to do in your life tonight? Are you believing God to deliver you in certain areas of your mind? Are you believing God to regulate your mindset, to change your thinking? Are you believing God to fix situations in your heart, to change your lifestyle? And different many things we go through in this life, but we choose to stay in it instead of giving God the power to come into our heart to change us. So just as centurion believed, Jesus did not even go to his house. But because he spoke a word, he believed it, and his servant was healed. So positive minds produce pro positive lives. Negative minds produce negative lives. Hear what I just said? Positive minds. So you got to surround yourself around positive things, around positive people, read positive stuff that's going to produce a positive attitude, a positive lifestyle. Because if you don't do that, negative minds will produce negative lives. So if you continue to be around negative people, that negative energy will impact your spirit 
to the place it drives you to a, to a, to the wilderness of darkness. And before you know it, you become negative. And now, so now you're evil. You're mean. You, you're stubborn. You're fighting folk. You're arguing with folk. Why? Because you allow one negative seed to be sown in your heart, in your soul mind. That's why it's so important to guard your ear gate. Your ear gate is the access that the enemy uses to get to your mind. It comes through music, comes through televisions, comes from people, comes from churches, comes from your jobs, comes from your community, comes from the news. It's all kinds of stuff we entertain throughout the day that goes into our ear gate. Even the stuff we speak out of our own mouths that are not, ne not positive, but negative. It will bring an impact throughout your day of negativity. Positive thoughts always full of faith and hope. Positive thoughts are always full of faith and hope. Negative thoughts are always full of fear and doubt. So if you're taking notes, you need to write that down. Positive thoughts are always full of faith and hope. Negative thoughts are always full of fear and doubt. Why? Because it's operating by the enemy's mindset, his control. I talked about Sunday, mind control, in our church. And the Lord reminded me of how the cartoon, the Incredibles, how Megamind was, a, was an enemy that had, had created a device that can reach the entire world to control their minds. But the Incredibles had to come up to fight against him to stop his his his, his uh, invasion from from control from controlling society and in the process destroy his machine. We have an enemy who's called Mega Mind. Mega Mind he comes into your influences and around your environment, around people that he brings into your life. He will bring different things in in your life to impact your thought life. To bring you to a place of fear, doubt, and unbelief. Some people are afraid to hope because they have been hurt so much in their life. They have had so many disappointments, they don't think they can face the pain of another one. So many people live in the place of hopelessness because of the things that have hurt them even as a childhood, to the adult life, in relationships, in marriages. People have been hurt. They've been disappointed. They've been scarred. They've been bruised. They've been wounded. So in the process, you set your guard up against anything positive that's going to produce hope in your life to keep on living. So you get to the place you shut down when God is speaking to you to tell you, cast your cares upon me for I care about you. You, sit, you tell God, no, God, it ain't going to work. I done tried that already. It didn't work for me. Why? Because you had no faith. If you come to the place of casting down your imaginations, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 4, it says, cast down every imagination, every high thought that saw itself against the knowledge of God. You got to cast down your thought life that's not of God and allow the Holy Spirit inside of you to bring you to the place of deliverance in your mindset in order to see yourself living a victorious life. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It didn't say building up strongholds. It says, the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. So we don't fight flesh with flesh. We fight the flesh with the spirit of living God through the word of God to bring it to subjection to the lordship of Jesus Christ. When you get a revelation of who you are and what God has done for you through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, it sets you free on your inner man to where everything that produced out of you is life. So when you get to the place of hopelessness, you remind yourself, just like Jeremiah in, in the book of Lamentation chapter 3, I think it's the 17th verse or around there, when he said this one thing, I recall to mind that there is hope in the Lord. You have to encourage yourself. You got to remind yourself that every time I went through anything in my life, God always brought me through. You can't see it 
when you're blinded by the enemy. It tells us in the word of God, if the gospel is here to, is here to them who are lost, whom the godless world has blinded the minds of them. So the enemy blinds your mind from receiving a revelation from the truth of God's word that he knows that will make an impact against the kingdom of darkness in your life. So he'll do everything in his power to set up strongholds. That's why I said the word didn't say mighty through God to put it to building up strongholds. It says the, the weapons are worth it that mighty through God to tearing them down, breaking them up, shattering them, destroying them. But you got to allow the Holy Spirit to operate in your life to do what God has promised. He said, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, hallelujah, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You cannot live a victorious life living in strongholds and bondage. You got to get a revelation that is not God's will for me to stay in prison. I said this a few weeks ago, how so many people are in a spiritual prison and don't want to get out. So you get suicidal thoughts, you get depression, you get anxiety, you get worrying, you get stressful. Why? Because you're in prison. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he unlocked the prison doors for all those who were held captive in the spiritual grave. And it said, when he rose again, even the departed souls rose up with him that believed in him and began to roam the earth. That's how powerful Jesus is. When he rose from the dead, he brought you your redemption. He took the keys from the devil of hell and heaven and earth and he unlocked the door so you can walk out free. But we go right back to the same place and lock ourselves back in our prison. You know, I, I, I met a person a long time ago who was accustomed to being in prison. When they got out of prison, because I used to do prison ministry back in, back in the uh, 90s, and this one person said, I can't live in society outside of prison. I done spent the majority of my life in prison, so outside of prison, I won't survive. Why? Because of the mindset. He programmed his mind. Well, yeah, he programmed his mind, but he allowed the enemy to program his mind to make him believe that you cannot survive outside of prison. You have a lot of church folk been going to church for 30, 40, 50 years and still are living in a spiritual prison and never been set free because they go to church out of religion and not a relationship. It's a difference when you have a relationship with Christ than have a religion. Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees because he said, your religion, it negates the power of God's word from being effective in your life. We got to get a revelation. We got to open our eyes and allow the Spirit of God to open our eyes to see where we are, whose we are, and the life we should be living. Therefore, they refuse to hope so they won't be disappointed. Do you know somebody like that? You might be that way yourself. Refuse to have hope in anything because you don't want to be disappointed. You know how many times I've been disappointed in my life? Over a dozen times. But one thing about it, disappointment doesn't have power over you. You have power over it. But you choose to let disappointment have power over you every time you negate the word of God and say it ain't going to work. God's word doesn't have no power over my thought life. The enemy controls my thought life. I'm not going to give in to God's word because every time I trust God in his word, bad stuff keep on happening to me. It's all part of life where you're going to go through some suffering, some trials, and some tests. Why? Because you name the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When you trust in God's word, the enemy knows, hey, I know what button to push in your life to knock you off course. So he had come to the place to influence you to be disappointed. And he knows if I can get you in that one particular area in your life where you've been disappointed, you've been discouraged, you've been scarred, you've been wounded, you've been broken, you've been torn, you've been broke down. That one area is the area he's going to target the most to distract you. If he can distract you from the truth of God's word to look at the flesh, 
through the eyes of the flesh, then you won't see Jesus. But I come to encourage you tonight that you can see Jesus even in your despair. You can see Jesus even in your storm, just as Peter, when the disciples were on the boat, and Jesus said, go to the other side, he said, I'll meet you there. And when they got in the boat, began to go to the other side of the lake, there arose a storm. And the storm came, and the wind began to beat against it, the wave began to beat against the ship, and the wind began to toss the ship. And the disciples were, were panicking, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. And when Jesus came walking on the water towards them, Peter said, Lord, if that's you, because they said it looked like a ghost. He said, if that's you, Lord, then bid me to come to you, to walk on the water. And Jesus said, one word, come. He got out the boat. He had enough faith to believe I can step out of the boat, walk on the water in the midst of the storm. How many times have you allowed the storm to di dictate to you what you can and cannot do? Peter knew within his own ability, I can't walk on no water. I can't even do what Jesus do. But he had enough sense to show the other disciples that you got faith in Jesus, you can do the impossible. I remember years ago, a friend of mine had spoke this word to me. He said, if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. If you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. And that's what Peter did. He saw the impossible, but he saw the possibility that was in Jesus and walked in the water, go to Jesus. But then when he took his eyes off of Jesus, the scripture says, then he began to sing. But Jesus, being merciful, sovereign, and holy, and compassionate, reached down and grabbed him, and they walked to the boat. You can do the same thing. You can walk above your water. You can walk above your storm. You can walk above your situation. You can walk above your pitfalls and your despairing moments. Because Jesus is walking with you and reminding you that, hey, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This avoidance of hope is a type of protection against being hurt. Disappointment hurts. So rather than be hurt again, many people simply refuse to hope or to believe that anything good would ever happen to them. This is the type of behavior that sets up in a negative lifestyle. So because you've been hurt so much, you put up your, your defense mechanism, guard yourself in a place of a spiritual prison so you won't be hurt again, but all the time you're really hurt. You're hurting yourself by being hurt. So you allow somebody else to inflict you with the hurt. You put yourself in a spiritual prison to keep you hurt so you never be healed. And he said this is the type of behavior that's set up as a negative lifestyle. Everything negative becomes a thought of negativity. Remember Proverbs 23 and 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you think yourself in a place of a box or a, 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 a prison, a secure place, a comfort zone, guess what? That's what you become. So you never be free from the pain that other people inflict upon you. You never be free from the torment of your mind. You always have negative thoughts in your mind. You always see yourself miserable and in despair. You'll be nagging and complaining all the time. Why? Because of the negative mindset you allow the enemy to imprison you with. So you got to be free tonight. You got to be free. I pray this is helping somebody. It's helping me if it ain't helping you. So you got to make a choice. You got to make a choice to allow the word of God to be planted in your heart. So as you believe in this word, you allow the word to take roots in your heart, to manifest, to bring you to the place of freedom that's found in Jesus. In the book, it says, and I'm on page 37 on the Kindle version. So many years ago, I was extremely negative. I always said that if I thought two positive thoughts in a row in my mind, would get a, I would get a crown. The whole philosophy of this, if you don't want to expect anything good to happen, then you won't be disappointed when it doesn't. So, a lot of people do the same thing. 
They already premeditate. They plan ahead to not be hurt. So you become extremely negative. You think in your mind that two positive thoughts in a row, well, you will get a crap. So no, it was not normal to think positive thoughts. Well, and the whole philosophy is, if you don't expect anything good to happen, then that's what a lot of people do. They don't expect nothing good to happen to them. I know people like that. And that's all they, they, they live by is negativity. Things never good happen to me. How come they always find money? How come they always get blessed? How come all, God always do this for them and I don't never get nothing? Your confession. Every time you confess what you don't have, you're not appreciative of what God has given you. So you shut yourself down from having the avenue open up before you to receive the blessings and the promises that God has for your life. So you set up this blockage in your heart. It's like a blood clot in the bloodstream. When people get blood clots in their bloodstream, it stops the flow of the blood to get into the brain. And before you know it, your body shuts down. Why? Because it's not getting the oxygen from the blood to keep it functioning. So the enemy does the same thing. He'll set blood clots in your spiritual bloodstream to block your mind from receiving the word of God. So he put this negative stuff inside of you to stop you from living. So you get into the place where you feed your spirit with all this negative junk from the world, from other people, and what you said about yourself, how you doubt yourself, how you, you always get in a place, you don't believe in yourself, you become inferior, you become intimidated, you don't feel like nobody cares about you, so you shut yourself down and you say, okay, things will never get better for me. And that's exactly what you're going to have. Because so as you think in your heart, you speak it out your mouth, that's what's going to manifest. So, then it goes on and says, I had, I had encountered so many disappointments in life and so many devastating, devastating things had happened to me that I was afraid to believe that any, anything good might happen. I had a ter terribly uh, negative outlook on everything. Since my thoughts were all negative, so my mouth, so was my mouth, therefore so was my life. So, so many people do just what I just read. They encounter so many moments of discouragement and disappointments in their life. Devastating things happen to them back to back to back. It's like one family member died and somebody else died, somebody else died, somebody else died. So you think, well, you know what? If this is, is what's going to happen, then I'm going to die. That ain't true. God doesn't say that about you. Just because people are dying in your family back to back to back doesn't mean that's the same destiny for you. But because you think that way, you think yourself sick. I remember I said this in the earlier lessons before that we can think ourselves well or we can think ourselves sick. And it goes back to the time when I was in the hospital and was being diagnosed with cancer. And God had told me, he said, he said, you will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. And God said, you can think yourself well or you can think yourself sick. And I choose life. So I said, God, I agree with your word then. I will not die but live and declare the works of God. So I thought myself to the place, even going through chemo for six months, I thought myself in the capacity of my mindset to receive the word of God on a daily basis. Three, four times a day, I was in the word, meditating in the word, speaking the word, praying the word. Why? Because I believe hope against hope. What the doctors were saying, I would believe in God's word for what he says. Because the doctor's word cannot trump God's word. Just like playing chess, God's word trumps the negative words of the enemy any day. You got to stay on God's word, keep that word before you, meditate on that word, speak that word, live by that word. So just like she said here, she was so negative to where she didn't expect anything good to happen in her life. And a lot of people do that now. And because they never expect anything good to happen, they had a negative outlook on everything. I don't look good. My clothes don't fit. I don't like the way my face looks. I don't like the way where I'm losing weight. I don't like this. I don't like that. So we think ourselves so negatively about ourselves till we get to the place where everything negative I thought began to manifest. When before, those things wasn't manifesting until you confessed it. Not only did you confess it, but because you talked about it so much, it began to happen. I used an analogy a week ago with a pastor friend of mine. And I said, if I came to you and I said, you look a little blemished, you, you start to look sick, 
And you know when you got up that morning, you were fired up. You were full of joy, full of life. And, and you knew that this was going to be the best day of the rest of your life. But all of a sudden, I put the thought in your mind. You didn't cast that thought down. So guess what happened? You pondered that thought in your mind. Instead of casting it out, you received that word. I look blemished. I look a little sick. And then all of a sudden, the confession come out of your mouth. You know, I, I was feeling a little sick there. I, I guess something is wrong with me. Why? Because I sowed a seed. Whatever seed you sow in your life, even when it comes to finances, I found out the key to success in finance is sowing seeds. If I sow a seed and trust God and his word that the seed is going to produce a harvest in return, guess what happens? God honors that seed. God honors the faith that you have for that seed to manifest. And in the process, the heavens open up, releases the promise on that seed. Before you know it, you got a harvest. Your bank account is overflowing. You have everything you need. Because God is a God that's a covenant-keeping God who will fulfill his word on every time we sow our seeds. And that way it goes with our thought life. The same way. If I keep sowing negative things into my thought life and letting other people to inflict me with negativity, the same things are going to manifest in my life to where it destroys me. But I have to make a choice to allow the spirit of the living God to come into my heart, to break down those strongholds in my mind that I can begin to see what God sees about me and say what God says about me and confess what God says about me to myself. I remember a long time ago, there was this apostle, I mean prophet that came to town in Milwaukee and he said to me, he said, man of God, I see you in charge over trucks. And he says, I see you in a position of authority. And he says, and God is going to do this. I don't know why God is showing me this, but God is going to do this. It took 10 years after that word that was spoken on my life for me being authority. I went into a security job. I was doing security for about 15 years. And, and when I got to this one place in security, God began to promote me. And before you know it, I was promoted to lead off the position in charge of older people and younger people. And it made folks so mad at me because I was younger than they were, but yet I was in authority over them. Why? Because God promises every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God will not return to him empty, but will produce and manifest what God has spoken over your life to come to pass in your life. And because I believed that word, I held on to that word as long as it took for it to happen. When, we, when I really began to study the word of God and to trust God to restore me, one of the first things I realized, I was negative. And it had to go. The negativism had to go. One, the first thing I realized that negative negativism had to go. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, Jesus tells us that it will be done for us as we have believed. The King James Version says, As thou hast believed, so it shall be done to thee. Everything I believe was negative, so naturally many negative things happened to me. So the more I keep believing in negativity, I produce negativism out of my life. Why? Because what goes to a man is what's not going to defile him. So I can get all this negative stuff. I can hear all the negative stuff. I can speak negative things over myself. Let other people speak negative things over me. And it gets into me. But until it comes out, I'm not affected. The only time it affects me is when I get to the place where all the stuff bombarded my mind. And now it's producing a negative ground where the seed is starting to produce fruit after its kind, which brings forth nothing but destruction, fear, doubt, and unbelief. That's why Jesus said it's not what goes into a man's heart that defiles him, but that which comes out of him. So whatever you allow to come out of you, what is going to cause your life to go into a pathway of destruction. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. It says, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your, your, let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. In other words, don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. Don't allow other people to distract you. Don't even allow yourself to distract you. Because if you allow distractions to deter you from your purpose, from the vision, the plan God has for your life, it will lead you down a pathway away from reaching your goal. We all have a goal that's set before us. Paul says we are to press for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we got to press forward. But we're not pressing forward. Guess what we're doing? We're regressing. In other words, I'm reverting backwards to my spiritual place of imprisonment so all the negative stuff, going back to the place of defeat, going back to the place of failure, never see myself of any value, any worth in the eyes of God. So anything that God has said about me now is becoming null and void. So you got to get to the place where we destroy speculations and every lofty thing that rises up against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, casting down every imagination, your reasonings, your fleshly mindset that rises up against the knowledge of God. Bring those thoughts into the imprisonment to be obedient to Christ. When you get to the place where you recognize, I can't make it without Christ in my life. The only way my mind is going to change, just like a caterpillar in a cocoon, is go through the process of metamorphosis. The metamorphosis brings a complete change. If a caterpillar was in a cocoon and he came out too soon, he would be deformed and he eventually would die. Why? Because the process of the change wasn't effective to the fullest. That's what we do a lot of times when God takes you through the valley of the shadow of the death and God says, I want you to go through this process I want to lead you through it, but we get to the place we start complaining and we're grumbling and we're murmuring and we're just getting negative and we're telling God, God, I can't do it. I haven't been in that before. I don't want to go through that again. I can't make it. So we doubt God in his word that he can lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. So we get to the place where we stop midstream in the midst of the storm. So in the valley of the shadow of death, I camp out in the shadow of death. When God trying to bring me out of the shadow of death, which is the entrapment of the enemy to keep you in darkness, God trying to pull you out, you tell God, God, I ain't ready. When your actions begin to resist and oppose God at his word, you're telling God with your heart, I'm not ready for change. And guess what? God ain't going to do it. He's not going to come into the place and violate your will to make you change. He waits on you to make up your mind so the man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if I think in my heart, I'm ready for change, I'm ready for deliverance, I'm ready to be set free, I'm ready for my mind to be filled with the Spirit of God so I can think godly thoughts, I'm ready for my heart to be healed, delivered, and set free, guess what happened? God comes in through the power of the Holy Spirit and he begins that work that he started in you to fulfill it. To bring you out into the place of victory. This doesn't mean that you and I can get anything we want just by thinking about it. God has a perfect plan for each of us. And we can't control him with our thoughts and words. But we must think and speak in agreement with his word and the plan for us. We cannot just think. With our natural minds, I can get anything from God. And one thing I had to learn about this, when I read this here a while ago, and reading now, it, it brought me back to a thought God gave me years ago. That how, how people just always talk about this naming and claiming. It was a, a great movement going around in the early 90s about naming and claiming. That if you name it, you can claim it. You can have it. You can do this. You can do that. One thing God spoke to me. He says, you can't get anything you want just by thinking about it. 
He says, you can only get what God has deemed and purpose to manifest in your life by his will being in your life. God has a will. God has a plan for your life. And the only way it's going to manifest in your life is when you get into alignment and agreement with God's word and allow the word of God to begin to produce in you a heart of surrenderance. So if it's something you need God to do in your life by your confession, God, I need a car. I want to thank you, Lord God, you're going to produce the finances or call somebody to give me the car. According to your will, let it be done. Not my will, not my desires, not because I want it, but according to your will. And when you line up with God's will and the plan he has for your life, that's why Jeremiah 29, 11, he said, for I know the thoughts and plans I have for you to prosper and do your harm and give you respect to end. Why? Because God already know. He knows what our mindsets are. He knows if we're really surrendered. He knows we're really yielded. If we're really walking in his word, or are we opposing his word? Are we living by his word, or are we standing against his word? If you don't have any idea what God's will is for you at this point, at least begin by thinking, well, I don't know God's plan, but I know he loves me. Whatever he does will be good, and I'll be blessed. So if you don't know the will of God for your life, you got to begin to line up yourself with God's word. Say, okay, God, I don't know the plan you have for my life, but I know you love me. I know you know the plan you have for me, God. I know the plan is going to prosper me. Whatever you have for me, God, to have for my life, I'm going to be blessed in it. And it's going to manifest. It's going to be a great thing happening in my life. And I'm going to change my thinking. I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to be positive about my life. And I'm going to do just what you say I can do according to your word. Practice being positive in each situation that arises. Practice being positive in each situation that arises, which is an indication that situations are going to happen. Situations are going to happen in your life, but it's up to you how you deal with them when they arise. You need to make a choice every day of your life. Just because somebody else comes to be aggressive and they're angry and they're mad about something does not mean I have to retaliate the same way. Because I know that God is on my side. He promised to fight my battles for me. Then I need to learn how to rest in the finished work of the cross and allow God to fight my battle. So if someone comes to me in a negative way, I can turn that negative into a positive. By speaking the word of God. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grief is worse than anger. Proverbs 15, chapter verse 1. So you have to think within yourself, okay, how am I going to respond to this situation that just came against me? It might be something I'm on a job. Maybe a person came to you a certain way. Might have been a way somebody spoke to you. Might have been something they done to you. It's up to you to determine the outcome. What is my response going to be? Am I going to respond with the word of God? Or am I going to allow my flesh to take his action and control my, my ideas and my thoughts and my action, my life. So I'm going to do just what my mind tells me. You have a choice to shut down the mind of the flesh and allow the Spirit of God to build you up in truth and righteousness, to respond in every situation in a positive way through the Word of God. Expect God to bring good out of it. He has promised in His Word. God has promised in His Word that every situation is going to work for the good. Because they say that we know that. All things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So if you know God's word has promised us everything will work together for the good, then it's up to you to allow the spirit of God to bring those things to pass in your life. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to second guess your belief and your trust in God's word. Stand on the word. Know the word. Proverbs 8.28 in the Amplified Version says, we are sure and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. So it's a guarantee that we have with God that all things will work together for the good. The scripture does not say that all things are good, but it does say all things work together for good. So you got to believe God for what his word says. Stand on the word. 
believe the word, live by the word, trust God in his word, and know that the word will manifest. The word will work if you allow it to work in you to produce life and not death in your mind, your heart, your soul, your will, your emotions. That everything about you will align it with God's word and produce a harvest of blessings if you don't faint. So as we come to the close of our lesson tonight, as always, if you decide to sow a seed into the ministry, it goes right back into the ministry for materials and books and things. Allow the Spirit of God to touch your heart to sow a seed. And trust God when you sow that seed. If it's something you believe in God for in your life to change, trust God that he would do that. I guarantee God would not lie, uh, lie against his word. But God will promise you that his word will manifest to bring the past according to his will, your life desire. When you delight yourself in him, he will give you the desires of your heart. So I pray this message tonight has helped somebody to encourage you to keep on trusting God in his word. Keep getting into the word. If you don't know any scriptures, go on the internet, look on Google. Scriptures about the mind or changing your thinking or how to control your thoughts. And I guarantee you'll find all types of scriptures on the internet that will help lead you to the word of God to help manifest in your heart to bring a change in your life from this day forward. So Lord, I thank you for this word tonight. I pray that you have not fallen upon deaf ears, but your word will produce a change in the mindsets of all the hearers. Not only we hear, but we be obedient to the word of God, to walk by faith and not by sight, that the word shall manifest in our lives to bring change. And I ask, Father God, right now, that you purify our thoughts and our actions. Forgive us for our sins, O God, the things that we have done knowingly and unknowingly, wash us in the blood of the Lamb, purify our thoughts and our actions, that we, Father God, would be surrendered, yielded, and release ourselves into your hands to be obedient, to do what you're instructed to do, Father God, that we be vessels of light and not darkness, and allow your glorious gospel to reveal to our hearts that when we see people, we'll speak truth and not a lie, and stand up, Father, as witness for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want to don't know Jesus, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God promises if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you can get to know him. And that if he, you confess your sins, he will forgive you for your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He'll come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. So if you don't know Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for walking in darkness. Forgive me, Lord God, for not being obedient to your word. Change my heart. Change my mind. And cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I thank you that you are able to come into my heart right now, God, and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord God, as I trust you with your word. I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for my sin. That I can receive the new life. Now be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. And that with power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So if you prayed that prayer, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that turned his heart over to the Lord. And then those of you who might be a backslider, the Lord is restoring you right now. I want you to pray this prayer with me, Heavenly Father. Forgive me for backsliding, turning away from your truth and your righteousness. Restore me, revive me, refresh me, make me new that I can be a vessel of righteousness and truth for you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So God is restoring you. He's reviving you. He's refreshing you. He's making you new. Receive it by faith and trust God's word that you have been born anew and that you are a child of God from this day forward. Now I pray you all have a blessed night. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. 
and know that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we love you, God loves you, and continue to share the good news. Spread this uh, message with somebody else who you think might need to hear it. It'll be on YouTube tonight, and uh, I guarantee that this lesson will bring a change in somebody's life and help produce a harvest of blessings in your life in return. Shalom until next week. I'm going to post also the YouTube link for those who uh, might be interested in sharing the link with somebody else. That you allow God to do that. Because all the lessons that we have been teaching have been posted on YouTube from last year up to this very day. They're on YouTube. So you stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus and know that you can make it. You can overcome because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Until next week. Shalom.